Hi, that's me. I'm a lawyer. That's your introduction. Hi. Right, so, we just heard a very good presentation about the regulatory regimes of different countries when it comes to working with crypto and doing ICOs. I'm, well, I'll give a slightly more extended introduction. I'm a lawyer based out of the United States, and I have this constant conversation with people of, do I form in the United States? Do I raise money from the United States? And the answer is sometimes, maybe. The point of this presentation is to explain how to raise capital in the United States, do it legally, and not have to deal with the tough parts of United States securities law, and to deal with the easier parts when accomplishing this. So there's a beautiful thing called Reg D, Regulation D, that I'm going to explore uh, during this talk. Originally, I was gonna cover Reg D, Reg S, and Reg A+, plus, but in 30 minutes, even if I speak twice as quickly as I normally speak, there's just no way. So we're gonna focus on Reg D. Okay, this is gonna be like one of those French New Wave movies where I show you the last scene at the beginning of the movie, and then we're gonna see how we got there, all right? So, this is actually the second to last slide in the deck, move to the front. The bottom line of do's and don'ts that you can get from this presentation, do, use Reg D, specifically Rule 506C, to conduct a private placement, I'll explain what that means, a private placement of securities, and raise unlimited capital, there's no cap on the amount you can raise, from an unlimited number of, of accredited investors. So again, you can use Reg D in the United States, Rule 506C, to conduct a private placement to raise unlimited capital from an unlimited, unlimited number of investors, accredited investors, and it's great. Basically, you can raise a billion dollars from a billion investors in the United States, and it's quite doable. Okay, you should, or do verify that these investors are actually what's called accredited investors, and I'll explain how that works, and do not take their word for it. Don't just believe them when they tell you this. Do not, don't, mess around with unaccredited investors. There's two reasons. Number one, it will blow your ability to raise all this money. Number two, they don't have any money. Why bother in the first place? Stick with the people who have the money, which are accredited investors. Don't mess around with bad actors, because again, that will blow your ability to raise all this money. And I'll explain what that means. And when selling securities and living your life, don't lie, tell the truth. That means don't make any misrepresentations of material facts or omit those facts when selling securities. Okay, that's the conclusion of the movie. Let's go. No, okay, we'll keep going. Okay, let's just take a big step back. Why raise capital in the first place? Why not just sit in your basement, program the next Bitcoin, and retire? Well, sometimes you can do that. But for the most part, whether you're doing a blockchain startup or a traditional brick and mortar, you need to bring resources and people and other ingredients or elements to, to the table to make that enterprise, to make that venture work. This model is true whether you're starting a business or whether you're starting a blockchain platform. You have this opportunity, you have this enterprise opportunity that's risky, it's not accomplished yet, or it hasn't accomplished all its goals. You have enterprise opportunity plus risk. What do you need to do to make this thing work? Well, you need to someone to come up with an idea and organize it, that's the entrepreneur or the management, need people to do the work, whether that's labor, automation, processes, or actual other work. You need productive assets. It used to be land or buildings, things have changed. Maybe you need intellectual property. You throw that, use that to sort of bake the enterprise uh, opportunity pie, and hopefully what comes out when you're done is it produces goods, it produces services, may produce technology, intellectual property, or tokens, and it sells those things. Now, the missing ingredient on the left-hand side is nine times out of 10, that's great, but that's not enough. Nine times out of 10, you need capital, you need investment dollars to bring these inputs to life so that you can produce these outputs. And it's nice that everyone has like their college savings built up, but most of the time you have to get money from people who are not actively participating in the business, but who want to give you money so they can take advantage of the business's success. Those people are investors. Well, actually, it's either banks lending you money, which I don't technically are securities sometimes, but we're not going to talk about that. Sometimes you can get loans. Anyone here getting a loan for their blockchain startup? 
I think I see some raised hands. That's impressive. Most banks I know will laugh if you say that. Most of the time you're getting investors, people or funds or other companies that are putting in capital, that are putting in money or money equivalents into the enterprise so that these things have a chance of working to produce those results. And as a side effect, though really it's the main point, this business is producing profits and or, because we're now in the world of blockchain, depreciation of assets such as tokens. So investors are either making their money or their benefit from getting profits or because the tokens that they bought as part of this investment go up in value. So this is why you raise capital in the first place. It's an essential ingredient for making everything happen. Okay, there's two modes that I see again and again when it comes to investors putting money into blockchain startups. The old days when they were just buying tokens or SAFs are kind of gone. And by, by the way, is, I'm gonna put everyone on the spot. Does everyone know what a SAF is? Does anyone not know what a SAF is? You're awesome. Because I think everyone else, half the people in the room should have raised their hands, maybe. Okay, a SAF is a simple agreement for future tokens. What investors will do is they'll give money to a company so the company can build its operations. And rather than getting stock, rather than getting equity back, they get a promise to receive tokens once the platform is built with the idea that they can then resell their tokens for a profit. It's a simple agreement for future tokens. It's based on an earlier form of agreement called a simple agreement for future equity, a safe. So uh, Marco, who's last century or something from the Cooley firm, uh, developed the concept of a SAF, got a whole bunch of firms to use it. Uh, then Cooley said, oops, we don't want all this risk, at least this is what I hear. Marco went to join a startup, but SAFs are still out there. So investors, when they put money into a startup, there's two modes of, this, of them getting something for their investment. You have investors, they put in capital into the enterprise opportunity, and they want to benefit from the profits or the cash flows of that business or opportunity. They normally get equity or shares. They get some interest, some ownership interest in the underlying company. And that routes back to the investors. Or if we're in this brand new blockchain world and they want to take advantage of the fact that the token's going to go up in value as the platform gets built and as it gets customers, they'll get tokens either directly or indirectly because they'll get a SAFT that converts into tokens once a platform is built. So these are the two primary ways that investors put money into a blockchain startup and sort of have an interest as a result. Both of those things, shares in the underlying company or tokens that may appreciate the value prior to the uh, platform being functional are securities. Okay? Before the platform is functional, tokens are securities, whether they can end up as securities or not, and shares in the company are always securities. Right? So I'll just read the bottom. Shares of stock and staffs are both securities as are many other instruments of investment. Okay, who's, now, for the first year of going around the world and giving presentations, I kept on talking about the Howie case. What the heck is Howie? Well, there's this line that I'll get to in US law that there's all these things that are securities and there's also a concept called an investment contract. An investment contract is sort of a bucket category so that if it's not one of those listed things, but it really is an investment, it really is a security rather, it will be treated as a security underneath US law. Right? And there's four factors to the Howey test and I would give long presentations on it. This is the summarized version. Basically, here's a security in reasonably clear English. It's the legal interest which an investor receives in exchange for contributing capital whether it's money or some other thing of value, for example, that person's labor or intellectual property, to an enterprise in the hopes of realizing a profit or other economic benefit resulting from the enterprise's success. In other words, the benefit that the investor is looking to receive is not paying $20 and getting toaster back. It's paying $20 and getting some share of the profits of the toaster company, right? They're investing in the company they're not just a consumer buying a product. So uh, the investment money 
in an enterprise in the hopes of realizing a profit or other economic benefit resulting from the enterprise's success, but where such outcome is not guaranteed and the invested capital is at risk of being reduced or lost. If you go to a store and you give $20 for a toaster and you get the toaster back, the toaster company can go bankrupt, your investment in the toaster is not at risk. Okay, that's not a security. A toaster is not a security. But if you invest in the toaster company and it goes bankrupt, your investment's at risk. It's that element of risk that makes a security a security. That's why it's inter enterprise opportunity plus risk. Without risk, it's hard to say there's a security. Okay, so the short version of the short version is a security is an investment contract. Okay. Selling securities is scary. Uh, we just heard the last presenter go on in good detail about all the different countries and all their different legal regimes. Every developed economy on the planet, in other words, every economy that has money that you want from investors, has complex laws in place regulating the sale of securities. The countries that don't have complex laws don't have any money. Okay, there's a correlation there, because they really don't have as many people to protect. The United States, especially uh, because of the US's history and the stock market crash of 1929, has a reputation for our securities regulation being extremely complex and punitive, meaning punishing. It has that reputation, I'm not, I'm not saying that's correct. And every country has an agency or an organization that regulates securities within that country, in the United States, it's the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. And the SEC itself has a reputation for being very aggressive in protecting U.S. investors. And the SEC, when it looks at, the, at its juris, uh, jurisdiction, in other words, where it's permitted to act, from its point of view, if a rock falls in Zimbabwe and 10 years later a U.S. investor is hurt, the, the SEC thinks that it's, that it's the SEC's business to handle that issue. In other words, they don't respect U.S. borders. Or at least they have that reputation, I should say. Okay, so, wow. U.S. law is complex and difficult, it seems, and the SEC is aggressive, but why bother with it? Why? You know, there's all these ICOs that say, oh, if you're a U.S. person, you can't get, get involved with this. Oh no, we're just gonna stay away. Well, here's a reality check. I mean, China is not allowing ICOs right now. The, national, the largest national economy on the planet is the United States. It's also the deepest and largest capital market. Okay, it's not just the biggest economy, it's the place where the money is available for the purposes of being invested. U.S. investors want to invest in blockchain projects, and they do. I worked on several deals where millions of dollars have been put into blockchain projects. You just need to do it right. The money is there and people want to invest. Also, and this is a little bit more subtle, your token sale, your ICO, is a public relations and marketing event. Okay, assuming you're selling a utility token and you want your platform to come to life, it's not gonna come to life if no one's using it. Okay, you, you need to let people know about what you're doing. Well, if you leave out all the consumers, all the users in the United States, even if you ignore it for investments, you're gonna have a real problem because your competitor, who's not afraid of raising money in the United States, We'll go ahead and do that, and they'll get all the, that money and all that capital. And I'll go into detail on, about this, but U.S. regulation of securities actually isn't that bad. Because even though the default rules are strict, there are many exceptions and exemptions from the default rules. Right? So it's like, it's like getting a 10-year jail sentence and then getting 11 years off for time served. Okay, I can live with that. Okay? I'm glad that resonated. Okay. Am I going too fast? I'm... Okay, he thinks it's okay. Too fast, too slow, thumbs up, thumbs down. All right, good. All right. I worked at two o'clock in the morning on this graphic. I want you to appreciate it. This is the best I could do at two o'clock in the morning. Everyone else was drunk. They were loud. It was German. It was Russian. I didn't hear any English. This is what the result. Okay? So, after the stock market crash of 1929, the U.S. said, or we should probably do something about this. So they implemented five core laws that form the basis of securities re regulation in the United States. Th this is the core. And those two at the top 
are related. Most countries have one core law governing securities. The US had two, why? Well, we had the great crash, and we were about to fight World War II, and everyone was kind of busy, so they, kind of, they couldn't get it all done at once. The two core laws are the Securities Act of 1933, generally referred to as the Securities Act, that's how everyone refers to it, and there's the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. The reason I have a line between them is they can really be considered, from, from a sort of meta perspective, to be the core laws that are really the law. Okay, Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. Now, the three later, lesser laws, depending how you want to say it, that are very important, but they're more niche. There's the Trust Indenture Act of 1939, which covers the sale of bonds, i.e. the sale of corporate debt. There's the Investment Company Act of 1940, which generally is, say, mutual funds, but though not always that. Then there's the Investment Advisors Act of 1940, which is people who receive money for giving advice regarding investments. Okay. All these five are all connected and they form a web of regulation and statute that if you look at them all together, makes some sort of sense. But the main ones to focus on are the top two, the Securities Act and the Securities Exchange Act. And for this presentation, for a reason I'll explain in a second, we're gonna focus on the Securities Act. Okay, let's say hello to the Securities Act. It's amazing, given how much money is at stake that can be raised and how much jail time is available and how much jail time you can avoid, it's amazing how, many, how few people actually read the law. In fact, securities attorneys have a real bad tendency of not reading the law. So you're now ahead of 90% of US securities attorneys. Okay, this is the introduction to the Securities Act. It has two main points. Okay, it's to provide a full and fair disclosure of the character of, of the securities being sold. Disclosure, not merit, disclosure. To provide full and fair disclosure of the character of securities sold. I'll skip the middle. And to prevent fraud in the sale thereof. Okay, full disclosure, prevent fraud. That's the point of the 33 Act. Right? And you have a friendly little short title in section one. Moving right along. Okay. What does, what does the Securities Act actually cover? Well, here's some terminology that you should memorize so that you can call people on it when they use these words incorrectly and actually figure out what they're trying to say. Right? The enterprise that's selling or offering its own securities, its own, it created them, it's selling its own securities. It's not reselling them, it's not investing them, it's selling its own, it created them and it's selling it. To a US person, is called the issuer. It's not the seller, it can't be the seller, but the technical term is the issuer. Issue means to create your own securities and sell those securities yourself. Right? You're issuing securities. When you, and an issuer sells those securities that it created, it's called a distribution of securities. A distribution. So when you're reading US securities law, when you see the word distribution, that means that the issuer is selling its own securities to investors, not reselling, selling for the first time. All right. Now, when those same securities are sold on an exchange or over the counter, or, excuse me, or over the counter, or in some dark alley, okay, that's not distribution. That's trading. Okay, trading versus distribution. When you start reading the law and you start picking up on the vocabulary, you're like, oh, that's what I meant. All right. The Securities Act, remember, it's one of five laws. It doesn't cover everything. The Securities Act covers the initial or primary distribution of securities. It does not cover what happens after that first sale. So if I sell you securities, I'm the issuer. It's going to govern this relationship, this first sale. But if you turn around and sell it to someone else, in general, the Securities Act does not care. It only cares about issuer distributions. So if you're running a startup and you're looking to raise capital, that applies to you. Okay, that applies to you. You're selling your staffs or your tokens, or you're selling your equity yourself to raise money for yourself to your investors. Okay, so the 33 Act is what matters. Enterprise selling securities, the actual securities to investors. That's it. Okay, now this paragraph has caused more 
fights, breakups, divorces, bankruptcies, and lots of money for attorneys, and anything else. This is section two of the 33 Act. It's so friendly. You have definitions. If you want to look something up, it's in section two. The very first definition is a security. Wow. And it gives you this sort of enumerated list of all the usual things. Notes, stocks, bonds, the ventures, you know, profit share agreements, yada, yada, yada. It's the kind of things you would expect, especially stock. Most securities that are sold to individual investors are stock. There's also this concept I mentioned earlier of an investment contract. Basically, if it's a security but it's not on this list, it may fall underneath the definition of investor contract. Uh, the reason I have an orange there is because the Howey case that actually figured out what an investment contract is was about the sale of orange groves. In other words, land that was being used to raise oranges. Okay. That was me, that was me last night. Okay, I had to download that using this Cruises wireless. Do you know how bad the wireless is? Okay, does anyone have any good wireless experience? No. Okay, good, no hands. Glad I'm not the only one. Okay, so, why, why, why does the US securities law have such a bad rep? It's the default rule, okay? The default rule underneath the 33 Act is in section five, and that little thing means section. Okay, the default rule is that very top thing, and that's why this guy's so upset. It's that it's unlawful to sell or offer for sale a, or deliver securities unless two things are true. A registration statement has been filed and accepted with SEC. In other words, a big form where you get all the details about your security. And also, a prospectus, which is approved by the SEC, is delivered to the parties buying the securities. A prospectus is basically a long document explaining everything about the company or platform selling the securities and everything about the securities. I mean, keep in mind, a company could be doing great, the actual securities could be doing horribly because of their characteristics. So a prospectus is a written document that gives all the information that a buyer of securities needs to receive in order to have, from the first part, full disclosure of the characteristics of that security. Okay. To get a registration statement and prospectus approved by the SEC is long, it's expensive, it sucks. Okay, you submit to SEC and they give you comments. Then you have to respond to the comments. Then they respond to your comments responses. And it goes on for months and months and months. Six months, a year, millions of dollars later, you'll get maybe an approval. Okay, this process of filing and getting a registration statement into effect, that's the term when the SEC approves it, and also getting a prospectus that's approved, is called going public. All right, going public. And it did, the, when you first do that, it's an initial public offering, or IPO, which is what everyone did before ICOs came around. All right? If you're Apple or Google, do an IPO. But 99% of the time, forget IPO. You just want to get in some investment money, do it fast, do it easy, and move on. Okay, thank God, here comes, here, here, this is the beginning of the good news. So section five, it requires registration statements and prospectuses approved by SEC. Ugh. Well, thank God, we have section three. Section three is exempted securities, right? Some securities, even though they fall underneath the definition of what a security is, are nonetheless not subject to 33 Act at all, right? So, if the U.S. or any territory thereof, or a U.S. state sells a security, it does not need its approval from the SEC. So if California sells bonds, it doesn't go to the SEC and go, please, Mr. Federal Government, can I please sell bonds? They're like, we're a state, we get to do this. Okay, here's an interesting one. Any security issued by a nonprofit where none of the nonprofit's net earnings are nerd to the benefit of a private foundation. Now, I think we're all familiar with the Ethereum Foundation and the ES Foundation. Now, they're set up outside the United States, at least Ethereum is. You could theoretically set up a nonprofit in the United States, issue securities, and so long as none of the profits go to the people related to that company, be fine. Okay, did, did that tokens go up in value because the nonprofit's doing a good job. That's not really profits going to the investors. That's appreciation of something they bought before. Right? So just think about the fact you may be able to set up a nonprofit in the US and escape from this entire registration requirement. If you give securities to the existing holders of securities, you're fine. The last one's kind of interesting. If you issue securities entirely within one state, you're fine. 
Now that's okay, but here comes the really good part. Section four, I love section four. There's exempted securities and then there's exempted transactions. In other words, you may be selling a security that is a security, it falls within the definition. It may not be an exempted security. In other words, the law is presumed to apply, but certain transactions, certain deals involving that security do not need to be registered under section five. Oh, that's great. Here's the best one. Transactions by an issuer not involving a public offering. In other words, if you're an issuer selling your tokens or selling your stock to raise money and you don't offer those to the public, in other words, you do a private placement as opposed to a public offering, you do not need to register your sale with the SEC. You do not need to get a prospectus approved. You don't need to do any of that stuff. The default rule does not apply, which is great. Right? So the one to keep in mind is section 4A2. That's what's called the private offering exemption. Right? Now, just, just consider that there's lawyers involved. Does anyone really know the line between a public offering and a private placement? You do? You're hired. And I'll see you in jail and I'll bring you cookies. And not a file. Okay. All right. Um, actually, I'll give it a shot. You can use him as your lawyer, just don't ever catch foot in the United States. Okay. So, what, where, where's the dividing line? Well, there is a punchline to this, but until that punchline came around in 1982, the courts fought it out. And there was not a clear test, because the words themselves were vague. But they took some factors into consideration, and even though things have sort of moved on, these are important because they still play a role in the background. Well, obviously, if the offer is made to a relatively small number of sophisticated individuals, like five, 10, who knows exactly, but a small number, that's not a public offering. Okay, well, that's good. If there's no general solicitation or general advertising of the offering by the issuer, in other words, you're not on late night television after the infomercials are going, hey, buy my stock, it's $2, okay? Can't do that, okay, that's a public offering. All right, here's the interesting one. The issuer provides either an offering memorandum or there's sufficient public information about the issuer. In other words, in other words if you do adequate disclosure, well, you know, theoretically, that you could still be selling to the public with adequate disclosure, but the court said if you provide enough information and you're accurate, you tell all the material information, you don't leave anything out, then we'll give you a pass. Okay, the investors know the issuer. It's your cousin. It's your business provider. It's a prior investor. Okay, that's private. That's not public. Right? If they have access to management to ask questions before the sale, here's a key one. The investors are looking to buy the securities and hold on to them for the long term as investments. They're not looking for a quick resale. Okay, if they're looking for a quick resale, you might as well be selling to the public because God knows who's going to get those securities later. If they're going to hold on to them for a while, then it's not public. And if the transaction is confidential, you sign NDAs, you number your documents, you only let certain people see them. Well, that's pretty clear that's private and not public. All right, that's all great, but it's hard to apply those factors and know for sure that you're safe. And the US was going to the SEC and everyone else going, uh, thanks for helping us pay our lawyers millions of dollars for not giving us a straight answer. Can you please do something? So in 1982, which is, Quite a bit of time ago, but quite a long time after the 33 Act came into effect, the SEC came out with Regulation D. Okay. Laws are made by Congress, the 33 Act, the 34 Act, regulations and rules are made by the SEC. Okay, the SEC came out with Regulation D. Regulation D is really the name for a cluster of rules. There's Regulation D, and there's eight rules within Regulation D. Rules now, uh, 501 through 508, and these rules are taken together provide what's called a safe harbor. In other words, under 4A2, if you comply with those rules, if you live within those factors, you're probably safe, you probably have a private offering. But do you want to know for sure? Do you want to know without any doubt that you have a private offering and you're safe and you don't need to register? Then you can comply with Reg D, okay? If you comply with Reg D, then you're exempted from registration under, reg under Section 5. Okay, and these safe harbors in Reg D are based on Section 3B, which we didn't cover, 
but they're also based on Section 4A2, which we just did cover. In other words, it's articulating with more detail what a private offering actually is. Okay, within all the exemptions in Reg D, we care about Rule 506, okay, which relates to private placements. Okay, I, I'm not touching the 3D ones. All right? And then in 2012, the Jobs Act changed Rule 506 and made it awesome. And I'll explain how awesome it is. You want to use the new rule 506 C specifically. Okay, there's all these general rules uh, that apply to everything in Reg D. I'm not going to go into detail, but 501, 502, 503, 507, and 508 apply to all Reg D. Okay, now rule 506. This this is the key to the kingdom. Hey, there's two variants that matter when it comes to rule 506. There's variant B and there's variant C. Okay, but these both these variants share some common characteristics. Okay? In 506 in general, this is a private placement under section 4A2, meaning it's exempted from section 5. Okay? There's no, if you do an offering under rule 506, there's no limit on the amount of money you can raise. There's no limit on the number of accredited investors. Note that for it to work, you need to file a form D with SEC, and I'll cover that. Know that there's this new rule that you cannot involve anyone who's a bad actor. Okay? And I'm not talking like Justin Bieber in his first movie. I mean like securities law bad actor. Okay? The resulting securities that you sell in 506 are restricted. They want to make sure that people are actually buying them and hoarding them for a little while and not just dumping them on the market. And the management is available to answer questions. Those are common requirements for B and C. Okay? Now, let me cover those, those common uh, requirements in a little bit more depth. Throughout U.S. securities regulation, there's the idea of an accredited investor. The whole point of the Securities Act is to protect, you know, there's an expression like a fool and his money are easily parted. The idea under the securities law with accredited investors is that if people have enough money, even if they're stupid, we're going to assume they're smart, or at least they can hire people who are smart to help them. Okay, so accredited investors, you can be accredited investors based on several things. You can have annual income of over 200,000 or over 300,000 with your spouse over the past two years. You can have a net worth exceeding 1 million. You can be a general partner or officer of the issuer because the idea is if you're working inside the issuer as an officer, you should know the company that's selling the stock because you work there. In certain defined entities like private business development companies with assets over 5 million, they should know what they're doing. They shouldn't need the SEC's protection. All right. There's an investor who can demonstrate sufficient professional knowledge of unregistered securities. I wouldn't trust that at all. I, that's not objective. I don't know what that means. There's registered brokers and investment advisors, i.e. under the Investment Company Act or the Investment Advisor Act. They automatically qualify. And there's other categories. You want accredited, accredited investors. Okay. They have the money. It's, all right, this is what a form D looks like, or the top, rather. You'll never see a US form this short, ever, okay? Notice the name of the form. It's notice, I guess I use notice twice, notice of exempt offering of securities. It's a notice. It's not a please approve me. It's not please can I have that cookie. It's notice, notice of exempt offering, okay? The SEC is not approving a Reg D offering. You're just letting them know that it's happening. Okay, now here's the bad actor thing that's common to both 506B and 506C. Okay, if you want to do a private placement of securities under Rule 506, you're doing this because you want to be exempted from Section 5 and the need to register securities. Well, the issuer, not the buyers, the issuer has a whole group of people that are called covered persons. There's a whole class of people. And the question you need to ask and what you need to investigate is did any of those covered persons have what's called a disqualifying event. Okay? If the answer is yes, you got a big problem, and that's an unhappy phase. Because that will stop you, that will preclude you from using Reg D to escape Section 5, and you really do need your red shirt, and you really do need a prospectus. And if you don't know about the bad actor, and you don't do Reg 5 registration, you just bust it through Reg 5 and you broke the law. If all your covered people 
you find out who they are, and none of them have a disqualifying event, in other words, none of them are a bad actor, it's all good. You can use reg D. Okay, so who are covered persons? There's a whole list. It's basically the issuer, its predecessor, meaning the companies that came before, and affiliated issuers. The officers or managers or managers of the issuer, anyone who owns 20% or more of the issuer, and anyone who gets compensation, i.e. a commission, for selling the stock. So if your broker or best friend who arranged that million dollar investment, you're paying him underneath the table 10%, but that person had a disqualifying act, they're a bad actor and you can lose your exemption. Okay, what's that disqualifying action? They had a felony or a misdemeanor relating to securities. They are a broker that's regulated by the SEC and they're subject to certain orders from the SEC saying you're bad. Right? Or they're part of a national securities exchange or group and they got suspended or subject to discipline. Note that last part, disqualifying events do not include anything that happens outside the United States. Wow, so you can be in England, cheat a million people out of a billion dollars, get convicted for fraud, have your house burned down, move to the US, and you're not a bad actor. Okay, cool, whatever. All right. So the bottom line is, when you're doing, when you want to write D, you need to do investigations of your people. You need to get representations from them. I.e., they have to sign a document that says, "I'm not a bad actor. I'm good." And you need to add provisions to your agreements with, say, your broker or your underwriter or your finders, saying, "If you're a bad actor, you're out. No commission, and you need to let us know now." Right? That means you're doing enough due diligence that you're probably safe. Okay. I'm not going to go into all this, but keep in mind that when you do a Reg D offering and sell stock or tokens, the people who buy those things, the investors, cannot immediately turn around and resell them. They need to hold them for a certain period of time. Right? Otherwise, it might as well be a public offering. Well, when do you know when you can sell that stock? When can you resell it? Well, one way you know is because Rule 144 applies. Basically, if a year passes, you're generally good. Okay, now here's the money. Rule 506B. It's unlimited accredited investors and up to 35 unaccredited investors. Now, when it comes to them being accredited, you just have to have a reasonable belief that they're accredited. You don't have to like dig up the birth certificate. You may not advertise your offering to the public. No late night television, no website open to everyone. You may not, that's 506B. And if you have any unaccredited investors, you have to provide them with a long document explaining what the heck you're doing so like a smaller version of prospectus, and if you give it to one person, you have to give it to all the people. Eh, that stinks. I don't want to deal with this. The Jobs Act put in 506C. I love 506C. You want to use 506C. Get rid of the unaccredited investors. They have the money anyway, okay? Take advantage of the unlimited accredited investors. Unlimited, excuse me, unlimited accredited investors. Now, notice, you need to verify that they're unaccredited. You need to dig in their background, and I'll show you how. But if you do this, wow, you can do a general solicitation and advertising to everyone. That means you can advertise your stock sale. You can advertise your SAF sale. You can put up websites. You do not need to limit access like you do with 506C. You don't need to know the people that you're selling to. So that's kind of weird, because if you look at 4A2, which is the basis for 506, it's called the private offering exemption. How can you have a private offering exemption when you're allowed to advertise and solicit to the whole world? The answer is under US law. Okay, cool. So POW, right? They will get that, that's like huge. You can advertise to the world and sell your tokens and sell your stock so long as you're only selling to accredited investors and you verify that they're accredited. In other words, you can reach out beyond your immediate network. You can reach the world and raise money. Okay, how do you know that they're accredited? There's all these factors, but basically you need to dig in. Okay, they need to answer questions. You look at their public information. You can look at their tax returns. You can look at their brokerage statements. You can get their accountant to say that they are. You can get a third party service. I think there's like accreditedinvestor.com. So long as you have a reasonable belief that they're doing their job, that's good, you need to verify. Okay, now, here's the last final note on 506C. The mandatory disclosure that's associated with 506B does not apply to 506C. You do not technically need to provide a big complex document explaining what the heck you're doing. 
Nonetheless, I, I don't want you to register, uh, do a registration statement with SEC, but nonetheless, if you're taking advantage of 506C, even though you're not required to do it, I strongly suggest that you give them that document. You can call it an offering memorandum, you can call it a private placement memorandum, or a term sheet. Keep in mind, you're taking people's money. They're trusting you with it. They deserve to know what the heck you're going to be doing with it. Plus, if you do a good disclosure document, it shows that you're serious. If you're raising millions or hundreds of millions, you can do a document explaining what you're doing. It's not just a white paper explaining the technology. It's like, here's the company. Here's our management. Here's our vision. And here's the technology. And here's another really good part. The more you disclose, the more material facts you disclose, and the more you don't leave things out, the less people can sue you for. Because people can't sue you because they're stupid. They, they can only sue you if you commit fraud. So if you tell the complete story, and you're like, oh, I'm buying a bridge that I'll never build. I'm running off to Switzerland with your money. They go, oh, good, that sounds good. OK, well, you disclose it. Oh, well. Right? You get busted for what you leave out that's important, and what you put in that's a lie. Okay, this is, I'm wrapping it up. So again, this is like the French movie where I put the conclusion at the beginning, and here we are at the, at the end again. Use Reg D, Rule 506C, to do a, a private placement to raise unlimited money for an unlimited number of accredited investors. You need to verify that they're actually accredited. Don't steer clear of bad actors, and tell the truth. And if you want this deck, add me on LinkedIn, this is really the only thing you need a photo of. Add me on LinkedIn and send me a message. I want to thank you all. I like this idea of being an engaged audience. Thank you. Any questions for Brian? Questions, questions? This is the cheapest you'll ever get me. <laughs> oh, okay. Sir. Did I understand correctly? The accredited investors are U.S. persons, and then you can advertise to, to the whole world, and then it doesn't matter whether they're accredited or not. It's, it's a, a good question. question. I actually can we put back to the prior slide just so people can get the deck? Great. Okay, so I didn't have time to get into it. I kind of cut the topic a little bit. But if you're a U.S. company selling abroad, there's an exemption called Regulation S. Okay, if you're selling abroad to non-U.S. persons. And you're not doing it as a scheme to sort of sell into the U.S. through the back door. You're generally not allowed to do that, and that's a separate exemption from Reg D. So there's just Reg S. There's nothing stopping you from doing a Reg D in the United States, and at the exact same time doing a Reg S outside the United States. And lots of my clients do that. You just need to make sure that the two are not integrated, meaning you're not trying to be cute. You know, hey, I'm selling to my brother in Turkey. He's going to immediately be selling to my other brother in Memphis. Which is, you know, Memphis, US, not Egypt. Um, so you can use both Reg D and Reg S. The concept of accredited investors only applies to US persons. If you sell to some poor grandma in Hungary who has like two Copex just broke together and you know you didn't do full disclosure, we're sad for grandma, but the SEC doesn't care. The SEC only cares about the US. Isn't that nice? Okay. So accredited investors in the US and everyone else, whatever. Okay? But you can't commit fraud because I'll come back and get you. But you know, if I'm in the US and I'm selling to Russia, I need to comply generally with Russia's Russian securities law. But the SEC is almost unique in the world that it cares what happens outside of its border. Most countries don't care, and they're less aggressive. Now, prior speakers spoke about Bermuda. You know, I'm not saying be reckless, but just be aware that most jurisdictions kind of end at their physical borders. Yes, sir. Hi, Gordon. Hello. Gordon, that was uh, awesome. Don't, don't mention your booking. <laughs> you mentioned the booking, you'll be $10. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, Sonia Hansen, yeah. Now, if I am placing an ICO, and I'll use Instagram, blah, 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 no respect. Mm -hmm. You seem like a lot of my clients. Is that under the Section 5? If you're, OK, you don't technically place an ICO. So, so suppose you have tokens that will eventually be utility tokens once you build the platform, but they're not yet. So you're selling SACs, Simple Agreement for Future Tokens. And you're doing a regular exemption, and you're doing it under Rule 506C. Okay? Yes, you can advertise on Instagram. 
for accredited investors only. We have this opportunity. Come here. And you need to make sure when they buy, they are actually accredited. And someone goes, hey, I'm not accredited. I'm so sneaky. And they try to buy. Well, you, you need to verify their status. That's on you. Okay? But you, if you reject them, then you're not in trouble for having advertised to them. It's not that advertising gets control. It's only to consummate the sale of, or the purchase of securities when in fact they're unaccredited. So you can put it on Instagram, you can put it on Facebook, you can put it on MySpace. You can do whatever you want. You can tell the truth and don't actually sell it unaccredited. Okay? And it's on third. Hello, Gordon. Thank you so much for sure. detailed speech about the regulations. One question, if, for example, we already issued the preferred shares on the regulation of the United States and Security Act, do you help to find the way to find the secreted investors who is investing in blockchain startups <laughs> with a pleasure? So, like, how do you undo that little incident? Okay, yeah, that's common. Don't worry about it. I mean, do worry about it, but you're, there's lots of company in that, in that world. All right, so suppose you don't know about all this. Okay, and you sold securities and you didn't register. Okay. The, I'll give you the real life, I'll give you the legal answer, the real life answer, and how they interact. Okay, if you sell someone some stock for a dollar, okay, and the stock a year later is trading at five dollars, even if you didn't disclose every little thing, right, it's unlikely that that person is going to complain. Even if you committed fraud and it's selling it at five dollars and they can sell it for $5. You shouldn't have done that, but it's unlikely they'll complain. Okay? If, you, if like what's happening a lot, you sell all these tokens or agreements for future tokens and the value goes down, people are motivated. All right? They're gonna do two things. They can either sue and or they can complain to the SEC. Okay? If they sue, um, Section 12A of the Securities Act uh, allows them to do something called rescission. In other words, give me my money back. They, they can undo the agreement. Now, if the price of the token is going down, or price of Bitcoin is going down, the company that's having to give back the money may not have that money anymore, and that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. And so you're opening yourself up to rescission. Also, the registration requirement under Section 5 is not optional, it's mandatory. It actually says it is unlawful to do this. It's technically criminal, okay? Now, in real life, barring active fraud, the SEC, well, the SEC is a civilian agency. It's a civil agency. You can't put anyone in jail. But what it can do in case of active fraud, like bringing it up, you can refer to the Department of Justice and they'll bring criminal charges. But that's, you have to be really doing fraud. Okay? What they're generally going to do is bring a civil or administrative action against you. They can send you a cease and desist letter. Okay? They can order you to you know, give the money back to people. And the moment, when you start getting involved with those things, you're a bad actor. You're disqualified for the future. And you're in a long legal process that's painful. Okay, so what, you know, oh my God, I'm scared, what do I do? Okay, what? You, if some guy donated $10 and he's unaccredited, just give him his money back. Go, oops, sorry, you say, here's your money, sorry, here's $2 for your trouble. Okay, just forget it. Okay, some guy put in a million and he's US. Well, if you put in a million, probably in real life, he's accredited. Okay? So you can say, I've done this, you can say, look, you have a choice. I can either give you back your million, okay, or you can provide this documentation showing that you're accredited. Which would you like? Okay, now some people are gonna want their money back. If you're doing a good job, they won't. And you say, you know, or you can say, look, for everyone who proves that they're accredited, we're gonna do a token swap to the workable tokens. And for everyone who doesn't do it, here's, here's your not workable tokens. There's, there's, you gotta be careful with this, okay? But or, you know, you had the advanced tokens. Of course the first ones work. You would never cheat those people. All right? But you, you want to fill as much uh, credit information as possible. Now, as time passes, you're safer. Okay? And if you're diligent about following up, you're safer. I mean, the SEC's not have to stop capital raising. He wants it to happen. So it's a little sketchy on blockchain. Okay? And Thank you. That's it? Yeah. Thanks. I'll Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Please. Thank you.